This is Jonathan Ferguson, the keeper of firearms and artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this episode, as we've had a ton of requests for it right since the dawn of all time, Jonathan is finally going to be taking a look at some of the weapons from Payday 2. Uh, now, the less said about the, the gunsmithing of this, the better. Even though it's only a game, it still feels like blasphemy against this very rare historic firearm to see it effectively chopped up and with an ACOG on it. It's not right. <laughs> We actually recorded so much with Jonathan about Payday 2 that we'll be publishing two episodes for this game. So make sure to subscribe if you want to check out the second episode coming soon. And if there are any other games, guns and mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comments section below. Right, let's take a look at Payday 2. Not the most usual site in gaming, the IMI. Galil, which as I'm sure a lot of you know is a sort of cousin of the Kalashnikov. It's, so I, I, I tend to call it a derivative rather than a, a variant. It came in 7.62 NATO and 5.56 NATO uh, flavors, as well as a couple of different models. And what we've got here is the ARM, it's an automatic rifle machine gun, I think that's supposed to stand for from memory. And it's in 7.62, as we can tell from the, the sort of the length of the receiver slash bolt and the depth of that magazine. That's definitely a big chunky cartridge in there. Why is it in the game? Well, if you know your movies and your guns, the 5.56 version of this was in Heat, which is a massive inspiration for Payday. So that's why it's here. Incl uh, complete with bipod, the, uh, you know, it's the same basic rifle, but it is in a different caliber. I'm not quite sure why that is, except that they may well have wanted uh, a more powerful rifle for balancing purposes. Something a little bit different. We actually have one here, and you can see that they have modeled the, the magazine pretty closely. It's got the same pattern of reinforcing ribbing on it, some some pressed in, some pressed out of the sheet metal. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty good. This this is actually, actually a different variant. So it has a different forend on it, different butt stock, but it's the same basic rifle in the same caliber. So this is the Galil Sniper, not the ARM, but it's, it's the closest that we have. Okay, I'm looking at a couple of details on this thing that didn't seem to be on the actual weapon. And I'm not so sure about the line on the left side of the receiver. That, that may, be, may have been added by the artist. It's not, these are just blocky machined receivers. They don't have much detail on them. So maybe a bit of detail added there. I also noticed a line on the rear of the top cover that was literally a line on the 3D model, but that's actually part of the top cover, a reinforcement for the top cover on the glial. So that's actually an extra piece of metal that is spot welded on and wraps around and they've seen that on a, on a photo or something and tried to replicate it as a two-part top cover, effectively. That's not what it is. This, this is the kind of nerdy detail that you notice when you do this for a living and you have access to um, stuff like this. Again, as ever, not, not a criticism, just something that, I, that I've noticed. It's a Keltec. I don't think we have any Keltec firearms in the collection here, which is not deliberate. Um, it's just that they're not something. It's not something we've come across or had the opportunity to acquire an example of. I would because they tend to be innovative um, and low cost. So they are, they are sort of culturally interesting firearms, and I would love like an example of of something for the collection. Uh, if anyone from from Caltech is watching. <laughs> um, so this is the Sub 2000, which is a folding, sort of packable pistol caliber carbine with, uh, as you can see, the magazine in the pistol grip. It makes for a very wacky first person view because it looks so unlike anything else. Uh, the barrel sticking out the end with no you know, no visible gas system because it doesn't have one. And the, the weird sort of tubular buttstock arrangement, the cocking handle underneath at the back. It's all very unconventional and it's all geared up to folding into a compact shape for easy portability. Now that would lend itself very much to a game like this in terms of being concealable. So let's see if we actually get to conceal it. So I don't rem I don't remember ever seeing this when I did play the game. Got a shield over here. 
Right, yes, this thing does fold in-game, which you, I guess you might expect as at least a uh, deploy animation, but it does actually appear to be the gameplay element as well, so it will, I presume, it's the sa treated the same in the game as holstering a pistol under a jacket or something, such that no one knows you've got a firearm until you pull it out and deploy it. Though it's a, it's a good choice for, for this game, albeit when I tried to play Payday 2 years ago, I couldn't stealth my way through about more than about six feet before I was detected, <laughs> so it wouldn't really matter for me. But uh, in reality, it is, it is foldable, and because it takes Glock magazines, if you have just a normal pistol uh, Glock 17 magazine in it, you could just open it up and use it as we see here. If you wanted the long magazine that, that I'm seeing in the game, you'd have to take that out, which means it would be a take it out, open it up, fit the magazine, cock it as well. So it would be a little bit more time consuming. You couldn't just leave the, the 33 round magazine sticking out the bottom of the gun because it, it would not fit uh, down your trousers or whatever. Right, and we have abandoned all pretense at realism, and we have a shoulder-fired minigun, or is it meant to be the, the micro-gun? So for those of you who don't know, the minigun is called the minigun because it's the mini version of the Vulcan 20mm rotary cannon, Gatling gun. Uh, we have an episode, a loadout episode, on the minigun that you should check out if you haven't seen it before. The micro-gun is as the name might imply. So the minigun is 7.16mm, mini compared to the 20mm, and the micro gun is 5.56mm, micro compared to those other two guns. It does exist, it is a, an experimental variant, not as far as I know, adopted for military use, and not in use by anyone else as far as I know, but it does exist. I can't say which this is. The barrels look very heavy. Although they're short, they look very, very thick. I don't know what the game thinks this caliber is, or this gun is, is which caliber this gun is in. This shoulder stock is a bit bizarre. It almost looks like a man portable air defense weapon type grip stock. Uh, that's complete fantasy. Wouldn't work particularly well, but then shoulder firing any 3,000 round per minute rotary gun is, is a bad idea. Looks like we've got the battery and the feed system built into this contraption. So they have at least thought about, if physics weren't a thing, <laughs> how you would actually create a package that you could carry around and use from the shoulder, from the hip. But, which is a lot more than most games do. They generally just have the, the bare gun, no ammunition feed, no power supply, nothing. Give them credit for that. But it's not, for me, it's not a natural fit with a heist game. Okay, uh, I've got a bad feeling about this because we've got dual wielded assault rifles with what look like 60 round large magazines fitted to them. So I th oh, chaos is going to ensue, I think. Unless unless the game is going to re try to realistically depict what would happen if you did that and you weren't Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out in a moment. But these are the Bren 805. Think of it as a parallel to, I don't know, the ACR or the SCAR in America. A modern take on the AR-18 operating system, 5.56 or whatever caliber you, you you purchase it in. There are, there are a couple of options available. What you don't want to do is shoot them one in each hand. <laughs> so let's have a look. Right, as predicted, there's there's a nod toward the uncontrollability of firing a 5.56 short barrel rifle, fully automatic, one in each hand, but nowhere near enough. You pretty much have to put them under your arms, <laughs> or, or have absolutely massive arms and hands and, and everything else. Not advisable for um, bank robbers or anyone else, really. Now, the game seems to permit this aberrant behaviour <laughs> because in the gunsmith it calls this a submachine gun. It, it's really not. There was, at least, an argument to say that a very short-barreled assault rifle could be classified as submachine gun, but I don't think anyone with a technical mind would refer to a short-barreled 5.56mm select fire firearm as a submachine gun. For whatever reason, the developers have put it into that bracket and therefore you can shoot one in each hand and 
vaguely control it. Not great gameplay wise because in this game you've got to pick things up and move them around and stuff so I imagine that compromises the, the ability to use these. It's an F2000, or is it? Because the long barrel implies that it's the FS2000, S for semi-automatic. Now, we featured the F2000 before in this series. This is a normal F2000, so it is selective fire. It does have the conventional length barrel. Now, uh, the reason I've got it out again this time is to talk briefly about the tactical version, because that's what we see in Payday 2. Now in reality, ignoring the FS2000, well not ignoring it entirely because the railed handguard on the game version is basically the one for the semi-automatic FS2000, because the military slash law enforcement version had a an optional lower handguard that we haven't got that had a tri-rail on the front here, so you could put a, a forward grip on it, you could put a laser on the side, or whatever but it wasn't a tri-rail full length. It was just little little chunks at the front here. And then you think, well, there's a ta surely the tactical version has a Picatinny rail on it. Well, yes, and it was marketed separately as the tactical version. However, if you press this button, push up and pull off the, the plastic cover, all F2000s are the tactical version. <laughs> So if you ordered the tactical version, you were just not getting the scope or the, or the, or the um, cover for the scope. You could then fit, of course, whatever optical sight you wished onto the polymer rail underneath that cover. And that's what, if you've ever wondered, I don't imagine you have, but if you've ever wondered what the standard F2000 optic looks like underneath, that's what it looks like. So that's, <laughs> that's how you make an F2000 tactical. Yeah, something I've talked about before is the so guns in games where it appears they just rip the magazine straight out without pressing a magazine catch. Well, in this case, it's plausible-ish because the way this is set up is you push up the magazine catch as you rip out the magazine. So it's the closest we get to the video game gun shoving it in and <laughs> removing it without any kind of catch. Um, it also fits the very exaggerated movements. Most first person shooters are very exaggerated in how they do their movements. If they, if they haven't mo -capped, uh, motion captured someone with some real skill doing very swift reloads and things, then they will tend to very exaggerated motions so that you can see what's going on and perhaps to artificially slow down the reload. Well that kind of works, that kind of is true for this in that in here is a gasket, a rubber seal, and you are overcoming that, not so much when you put it in, but when you pull it out. So it, it does, it, it almost feel, it looks like a video game gun, and it kind of feels like one when you use it as well. Right, another Payday 2 gun that we haven't got. Uh, this is the Cry Precision 612. I've yet to see this in the wild, as it were. Really interesting design. Um, a rot you know, revolver shotgun, double action. You pull through on the trigger and the cylinder revolves to the next chamber and fires it in one pull. And you can, st well, as you see it here, it's a, f it's a firearm, a shotgun. If you strip it down, you can fit its receiver complete with the pistol grip or you can uh, there's a different form of receiver for it as well and attach it as an under barrel launch uh, not launcher an under barrel device on a rifle or a carbine so uh, like a almost like a transformer i don't know from from the footage i saw at the time it seemed like it had an awful lot of recoil depending on the on the ammunition the the reload involves taking out the whole cylinder and replacing it it depends how how economically the cylinders are made as to whether that's a problem for, for users because normally magazines are quite cheap yeah but it, it's visually quite distinctive it's something different as always as we always say on on this series you need variety Yeah, from what I've seen of this thing firing, it has a lot more recoil than is depicted in the game. And someone is trolling me again by, uh, yeah, cheers Dave, <laughs> by putting a, a charm on the gun. Although it is at least a gun, uh, a tiny gun on your gun, some sort of flintlock pistol, brass barrel thing. But yeah, he, he knows that winds me up. So apart from the recoil aspect, 
it's a pretty good game shotgun because we're, we're seeing guys taken down from what is probably fair to say are realistic shotgun engagement distances. We often don't see that in video games for the very obvious reason that not all guns should be capable of doing everything. Otherwise, you'd only use a shotgun. Now, I guess the limitation here is in the magazine capacity of only six rounds. Hence the name 612. Six rounds of 12 gauge ammunition, in case you hadn't figured that one out. Now, I didn't realise this was in the game. It's our old chum, the Volta, or Volta WA2000, that uh, famous but unicorn-esque bullpup 7.62 marksman's rifle. Or, well, legitimately a sniper rifle. It's engineered, like the PSG-1, engineered by Germans to be a true sniper rifle that's semi-automatic. Very distinctive looking. Has appeared in, in media a fair bit. Uh, this one was actually on the set of The Living Daylights. Now, different in terms of no well this is the scope that came with ours i don't know that of others that, that were an option on this but i'm guessing that's not the correct scope otherwise though is pretty good it's always handy when you can look at the actual thing it even has the uh, textured section here with the with the dip in it which is for your rear hand to support it at the rear a bit like a light machine gun it even models that so i think they've done a pretty good job I, my grasp of german is essentially non-existent but i happen to know that lebensauger means life sucker which is a little more on the nose as a name than wa2000 <laughs> and not a name that i imagine a german arms company would ever use but um not not inaccurate, I, I dare say. Shown to be pretty, pretty powerful, which it ought to be. The power level in the game is important, clearly, because of the enemies with heavy armor and sh ballistic shields. So there is a bit of precision shooting going on here using the scope, but a lot of the there's quite a lot of hip firing going on, more than you would normally see with a sniper rifle, and that's presumably a, a, to do with the armor. Uh, now, the less said about the, the gunsmithing of this, the better, because uh, even though it's only a game, it still feels like blasphemy against this very rare <laughs> Cold War era uh, historic firearm to see it effectively chopped up and with an ACOG on it. It's not right. <laughs> I like that suppressor sound effect. Sounds quite realistic, although it sounds more realistic for something like 5.56 than for 7.62. I think I'd expect more of a gunshot noise with a suppressed 7.62. Limitations of uh, software, hardware, my ears, my memory. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching as always. If you'd like to support the work that we do here at the Royal Armouries, you can hit the description and you'll find links in there to uh, ways that you can donate or join up and become a member of the Royal Armouries Museum. Uh, we also have social media outlets that you can, you can look up and our own YouTube channel uh, featuring yours truly. So if you're interested in that, head over to our channel. Otherwise, we'll see you again next week. Thanks again for watching.